you gather there that the Reformation, okay, Luther, Calvin, Twingley, Cranmer, Knox, all of the leading reformers were committed to the classic view that Jesus Christ died for the elect. He did not die for each and every individual. That was not the doctrine of the Reformation, the main string, the main sweep of the Reformation. That's not to say that no one uh, in the fringes of it may have believed it at that time. This theological aberration appeared soon after the Reformation and has since become ever more widespread and dominant, as I say, at least 90% of evangelicals today holding that position. James Arminius, who died in 1609, a Dutch Reformed theologian, was one of the first to part with the Reformed faith at this point. Unfortunately, his present-day sons and daughters are legion, even in the Reformed Church, which rejected him. As early as the 17th century, this deep heresy was growing. Since that century was the golden age of orthodoxy as well, we will turn back to it to see how this threatening universal design was met. Now, let me explain at this point. When I say I'm calling it a deep heresy already, and some of you who may think it's the very truth of God and may end the course in May thinking it's the very truth of God, you may be grieved a bit at my saying it's, her it's heresy, but in my opinion it's heresy, and you will see why I say so. And if you don't be grieved about it, just say that's the way Gerstner sees it and so on. He thinks Gerstner's wrong. That's what the course is for, and as I say, you'll have at least two speeches every morning to make any time you want to on that subject, and I don't want you to hesitate. I, this is a, obviously these people who oppose it uh, are able people, and they are by all odds the overwhelming majority at the present time, but at the same time, in my opinion, it's a deep heresy. How, how do you Just in their opinion, mine would be a deep heresy. How do we uh, divine, uh, define uh, heresy? I mean, what is the exact definition of when something is a heresy? Well, as it goes back in history, schism is a separation from the uh, body of Christ on the basis of practice. Heresy is a separation on the basis of doctrine. It's, uh, uh, schism has to do with practice. Doctrine has to do with, uh, I mean, heresy has to do with uh, doctrine. That's not necessarily the biblical use of hieresis, which seems to be a faction, but it's a faction based on a certain erroneous idea. Uh, but heresy, as we have tended to use it, and I tend to use it too, uh, is a deviation from, a, from doctrine. And the question is how serious it is. And you see, I'm saying this is a deep heresy, that if you followed out consistency, it would destroy the Christian religion and destroy the Bible. I'm not saying that uh, Billy Graham and those people carry it out consistently. But here's where that truth in advertising is concerned. You see, you can't just say something here and then refuse to take the implication here. You see, you just can't do that. There's certain problems. I've, I've mentioned one of them before. If God loves everybody the same way, in giving Jesus Christ. If he really loves them, and there's no distinction here, he has a love of complacency for them as unregenerate, impenitent sinners, then manifestly, why would Christ die? Well, these people say Christ died. They would never give up the idea that Christ died for sinners and so on. But what I'm trying to say here is, if God already loves them with a love of complacency, why would Christ die? What's the need for it? And how could they possibly be sent to hell? Every one of these people believe in hell, hell as well as heaven. But how can they be if God loves them? How, what a way to be loved. I wish God wouldn't love me if you're going to send me to hell and so on. But if on the other hand, he loves me with this kind of love, which I say in Orthodox Christianity, he loves only in Jesus Christ and those who are in Christ, acceptable in the beloved and so on. Do you get my point there? Yes, please. Wouldn't uh, dispensational argue that God doesn't love anyone with complacency before they're converted? They don't get into this distinction, you see. They just refuse to make the distinction. They do say that God loves you. He does love you. He hates your sin, but he loves you. And I keep saying to them, why doesn't he send their sins to hell and bring them to heaven and so on? But no, they have to go with their sins. And as I say, when you look more carefully at that business, God loves you, God loves you and hates your sin, that would secure eternal salvation for everybody too. Thank God, so whether I repent or not, since God only hates my sin, he's going to destroy them forever and so on, but he's going to save John Gerstner and so on, penitent or impenitent and so on. You ask me, what do they do? But no, they won't say certain things. That's my, that's my problem. When I say, here, they, here they'll stand very firm. I'll say, Jesus Christ died for everybody. God loves everybody and such things as that. And then I'll say to them, why doesn't this follow from it? And so on. And you say, that's when we play golf. You see, that's when, there's one fellow I remember when I was taking my doctorate and he was taking a doctorate at Harvard together. And we drove to the same place where our churches, were different churches, at least a half a dozen times. He's as sharp as a tack, this fellow. At least a half a dozen times. I went step by step by step to this particular conclusion. He would just simply refuse to accept it. They just refused to accept it. He changed the topic. As I used to say, go play golf and so on. About after the sixth time, I looked at the Lord in the face and say, Lord, have I not discharged my responsibility? And then I'd sit back and listen to him talk about the Austrian paper hanger, Schickelgruber, better known as Adolf Hitler and so on. He was an expert on him. And he usually, we talked about international politics. I'd like to sit back and listen to him. 
I had tried to communicate with him on this particular point. I got there step by step by step by step, but had no other conclusion than this. But he just refused, just cop out at that point, refused. What could I do? I can, I'm responsible only for presenting a case. And you ask where they do, they just say they just won't, they won't stand still for this type of thing. They won't face the consequences, but they're going to have to face the consequences. Some of them will appeal to Karl Barth for his deification of paradox. Some will appeal to uh, 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 Ralph Waldo Emerson as saying consistency is a bugaboo of little minds and so on. So I'm a little mind because I'm trying to get a person to be consistent with his own thinking. But whatever opprobrium you get or disregard you get or disengagement you get, you get something. Just a second, uh, John. Uh, I know. I'm debating on whether it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, I mean, debate's over. In defense of the accusation, wouldn't they say, you know, you say if God loves everybody, why would he send Christ to die? And yeah. wouldn't they say to satisfy his justice, his sense yeah. of justice? But he already loves them without justice, you see. Well, he, he, they realize that God cannot tolerate sin. Sin has to be punished. It was punished in Christ, but it was a universal punishment. Yeah. I mean, that would be their argument. It had, a uni not, it had it universal things. It fall down, but that would be their they argument. They have infinite, in, infinite consistency, uh, uh, sufficiency. Everybody admits that Christ's death is infinitely valuable because of his divine person. And enshrining his human sacrifice in infinite value. We all agree to the closing of the ranks on that particular point. But when they're going to make, uh, obliterate this distinction and make God the lover of, uh, of sinners and just the hater of sins and so on, not the hater of sinners, and God's called a hater of sinners time and again in the Bible, you know, and the wrath of God is upon him. As a matter of fact, there are at least three, somebody studied this thing statistically, there's at least three references to the wrath of God against sinners for every one reference there is to the mercy and forbearance of God. I mean, it's underlined and read in the Bible. It's something you cannot uh, delete. But the point is, if God loves people now the way they are, then manifestly they don't have to be cleaned up and get their act together and repent and walk in paths of righteousness. Now, obviously, they'd have a richer reward, you see, if they did that, and greater internal satisfaction and so on. Okay? We select a portion. Now we get down to the text of the Course. We select a portion of the Death of Death, the Works, Volume 10, Book 4, Chapter 6, pages 308 to 403 by John Owen. 1616 to 1683 to see how one of the greatest Calvinistic theologians of all time met this early threat to sound doctrine. Since I've had the privilege of being at Eastminster, I've tried to introduce you. I'm called, you know, theologian in residence, and I try to introduce you to classic uh, theologians. And we have introduced you to Augustine, and of course I taught a few years ago, and Calvin, uh, and uh, Augustine, the fifth century, Calvin, of course, the 16th century. Now we're coming to John Owen, a great theologian of the 17th century. Of course, you've heard courses of mine on Edwards, a great theologian of the 18th century. Hodge is our greatest uh, Presbyterian theologian of the 19th uh, century. So here you're being introduced for the first time to a great 17th century uh, theologian. You get the feel that this uh, John Owen's quite an uh, interesting man. He was, um, he was, first of all, a Presbyterian who left Presbyterianism for Congregationalism. And he wrote uh, very strenuously on that uh, subject. Always a very heavy, solid reform um, theologian. As a matter of fact, I have to translate his English into contemporary reader. His English is so packed down and compressed and academic that I have to sweat when I read it. Now, you people would you'd give up on the thing. I mean, not being used to it and so on. So though occasionally I quote him, there's one place where I quote a whole paragraph, so you get John Owen in the original, as it were. If that doesn't sound like a foreign language to some of you, I'll be a little bit surprised. But we get the feel. In the meantime, I try to state him in simpler English. His argument's quite lucid, but the turns of phrase are so rapid. He goes around corners so quickly and so on that you think I'm a slowpoke after you've read John Owen uh, uh, for, a, uh, for a while. He was the vice provost of, uh, of uh, Oxford University and a very close friend of the uh, uh, monarch, Charles II. Uh, I'll tell you this one anecdote about uh, Owen and uh, two things, uh, two anecdotes. I'll tell you. But one of this first anecdote is the fact that he had a great affection for John Bunyan and loved to hear him preach. And this would stand uh, Charles II on his ear. And he said to him on one occasion, how can the most learned man in Britain make a long trip to listen to this tinker preach in a drafty barn? And John Owen just said, sire, I would give all the learning I have to be able to preach as John Bunyan could preach. And so, but they preach the same doctrine, by the way. John Bunyan, in his own immortal idiom, not only Pilgrim's Progress, but Grace Abounding and the War and all that sort of, he read many things, but in a way that speaks to the ages that John Owen, with his superior intelligence and scholarship, uh, could not do. The other 
Uh, it's not so much an anecdote as it is a sort of biography of his life. The, his favorite text in scripture was the psalm that goes, uh, uh, there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. And he, of course, had a good time with that combination of ideas. Forgiveness, you see, would seem to spell indolence and indifference and apathy. But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared, was his favorite uh, uh, text. Oh, when the vice president of Oxford was considered by many members and so on, so on, so on. Profoundly weighty at uh, modern students nourished on a fast food theological diet find it almost indigestible. And I'm talking now to my seminary students. I never took them through Owen, but I, I, I once took them through part of Jonathan Edwards. And brother, they were crying uncle before I got halfway through a sermon. And that sermon was used of God for the first great awakening in New England. These New England farmers, in other words, in the middle of the 18th century were understanding theology that present day seminary students cry uncle when they hear, and so on. And Owen is at least as tight and as close-knit and as um, succinct as uh, Edwards. We will therefore simplify, clarify, and outline in somewhat, uh, in, in, in somewhat along with an occasional comment of our own so that the argument may be easy to follow. In this section, Owen is refuting Thomas More, whose earlier work advocated the universal atonement. Owen presents More's position as argument one, argument two, etc and his own response as answer one, answer two, etc. We will present Moore's arguments as quoted by Owen and then proceed to itemize briefly the refutations by Owen. This is to be a study in doing as well as learning theology. Each week I will give the class copies of the advanced material. Now I found I wasn't able to do that for problems of production and so on, so you've got it all at once. I had wanted to give you each day the, uh, the arguments that Moore would present and have you uh, work with that during the week and when we come back spend the first 10 minutes going over your way of handling these uh, apparently biblical arguments in support of the universal atonement. I couldn't do that so I'm going to ask you to try to do it with the limitations of already having the document in your hand but you know the structure of it. The, uh, I see our secretary was even able to get the arguments put in bold print, I think. I didn't ask throughout, so you can recognize that's more giving the case for the universal atonement. <laughs> what I wish you would do when you take this uh, document home with you sometime during the week, uh, don't read Owen. Just read uh, uh, more and look up his biblical references and give him full justice. Try to feel the argument as more pulsates with devotion and energy in the expounding of it and say, more John Owen and John Gerstner both think, uh, John Owen, I don't mention myself in the same breath except you know John Gerstner, you don't happen to know John Owen, so that's the only reason why I bring him down to earth here, but he's a man of real stature and so on. But John Owen and John Gerstner and people like that believe he's wrong. Now scratch your head and say, what's wrong with this? Because this man is going to be, he's going to be quoting scriptures by the half dozen and so on. And he's going to be arguing throughout that this is biblical and that what John Owen is about to advocate is unbiblical, and so on. So what I'm asking you to do is uh, just read what uh, Moore has said in the bold print. Read the scripture passage, feel his argument, and uh, if you're satisfied, well and good. But you know John Owen is not, and you know John Owen's going to critique it, and try to see on your own whether you can imagine, you may think there's nothing wrong with this. It's absolutely true. Anybody who says anything wrong, he must be wrong. All right. But nevertheless, put yourself in Owen's place and say, what in the world would Owen or Gershner or anybody else have to say by way of defaulting this passage? Before you read Owen or before you hear Gershner, or before you get into the classroom discussion, I wish you would do that. And then when we come together, the first 10 minutes would just be thrown open to you. You don't have to talk, and you can be quiet all the time. Some of you prefer not to. That's perfectly all right. But those, and you may have done the work, but just not care to, to speak here to me. If you ever want to write it out, that's all right, too. Give it to me, and I'll read it uh, anonymously or by name, whatever you wish, and so on. But at any rate, for the first 10 minutes, you just let the class wrestle. I'm going to see to it that you've gotten Moore's argument clearly, and, uh, and then uh, see, uh, once that's clearly grasped, 
what you think, if anything, if you think it can be refuted, what the reputation would be. And then the rest of the time we'll go over this material which is uh, presented here and uh, discuss uh, that. I think I don't have to say anything more about the paragraph. Any question about our procedure? You understand it's utterly optional. I'm not going to call on anybody, and you don't ever have to open your mouth in the class, but at the same time, I urge you to do the reading whether you do or not, and I'd like very much that first 10 minutes at any rate to be given over to the class to participate as it pleases, if it pleases. If you don't, none of you want to do so, I'll be sorry about that, but we'll go ahead with the, with the course uh, as is. Any question about the procedure, then try to remember, please, to bring these back, but I'll have 50 more copies run off during the uh, week uh, anyway, and get any of your friends who, especially your evangelical friends, who are uh, so absolutely pure that they, you, um, you mean to tell me there's somebody there over there in Eastminster who actually thinks that Jesus Christ didn't die, brother? You, you can't be serious. And as soon as you convince them, yeah, you're serious. What institution did he escape? Well, Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and so on. We're not the kind of institution you thought. He's actually a place of higher learning, uh, so-called. So. He's still in his right mind? And when you let him know him of 70 years old, well, you know they do try to flip into senility about that. But no, 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 he's really serious about it. And uh, try to get people over. Get them in, in the argument themselves. After all, you're the first one. But I mean, uh, bring them here if you can, but at least do the argument yourself if you, if you can. Yes, Chris. Mm -hmm. This, you know, that's uh, the phrase somebody, I should have headed you off before. I, <laughs> I, th I think this is the famous Thomas War of the Reformation period, you see. Great Roman Catholic uh, scholar. I have to check that up. I'm not able to find it. I'm leafing through, you know, and so on. I've never uh, taught the, uh, the book as a whole. The Death of Death is itself a classic. But uh, the reference to Thomas More, I just assumed, and I said, Chris, or somebody sure his life is going to ask me who had that sort of thing. But I, I looked it up a little bit, Chris. I couldn't find for sure. And my supposition is it's a famous Roman Catholic. The Roman Catholicism has committed it. These, are committed, these people are committed to it doctrinally. Uh, dispensationalism is committed to it doctrinally. When I say some reform people, you understand the difference. Doctrinally, reform people are committed to the opposite proposition. It's a real heresy in reform circles. If, if, uh, if Frank Pick, for example, did not believe what John Owen was, say, uh, was um, believing, teaching here, he would be unreformed at that point. He would be out of line with his own confession. Now, if somebody in a local Methodist church, for example, believed what John Owen was teaching here, he would be out of line with his tradition. There is a difference here, you see. It's a, a, what's, uh, this is what I'm teaching here. I wouldn't be teaching it if it weren't the official doctrine of the church. I'm, I'm here as a, a, a reformed uh, theologian. And if I no longer believe reformed theologian, I decline the invitation and such things as uh, that, but I don't teach uh, a doctrine contrary to the reform doctrine. And so uh, th there are, uh, as I think we mentioned in the other courses, a double standard here. You church members aren't required to be reformed. You heard some, uh, some of you did hear some people being received in the membership of the church this morning. What we ask of members of the church is that they believe the basic fundamentals of the faith and they promise to follow Jesus Christ. If there's a thorough course of instruction, they, it will be explained to them that they will be exposed to reform doctrine. They may not agree with it or believe in it, and they don't have to, but they, we don't expect them to agitate and trouble in the church since they know in advance that the church is of this persuasion, but they wouldn't be eligible for officership or for teaching in the church if they believe uh, other than that, but they're welcome as uh, members, and as long as they can bear this type of doctrine from the pulpit and teaching classes and so on, uh, that's all they're asked to, uh, asked to uh, do. But the ministry and, uh, and elders and ministers different. We, are, we affirm the system of doctrine taught in the Bible. If we don't affirm it, then we go elsewhere. For, um, if we're honest people, we go elsewhere for our ministry. And the same thing as saying there are a great many people in the Presbyterian pulpit today who simply are either ignorant or dishonest, one or the other. And again, I'm not saying anything to you that I didn't say in the seminary before while I was teaching there, as I said to those students who didn't like to hear this thing, if you people are not Calvinists when you are ordained, you are either ignorant of what your church teaches or you are dishonest in affirming that you do. And they didn't like that because they wanted not to affirm it and be honest people at the same time. And I said, you can't be both. You've got to be either not knowing what your church does require and some people do come in colossally ignorant and so on, or not being honest about what you don't believe and so on. 
All right, now we can at least break ground on the procedure. You get a little bit of a feel of the course, and the whole thing will run this way with the statement of the argument by uh, Moore, Thomas Moore, and then the refutation. I'll try sometime during this week to make sure that it's a hard thing to do. I was working in this big Baptist library down there in Fort Worth last week and uh, other weeks and so on. I try to track it down, but I haven't been able, but I ought to be able to find it. I don't know just where. But for the time being, let's assume it's the famous Roman Catholic theology. And as I say, that would, good be, that would be good Roman Catholic doctrine. Roman Catholicism teaches this, as the Methodists and a number of other churches uh, and the Lutheran church. This is, a, this is a reform doctrine. All of the Eastern church, all of the Roman church, and a number of Protestant doctrine, uh, churches are against this doctrine. They do not see the Bible as teaching this, but all reformed churches, all churches which have the name Presbyterian or Reformed in them, or historic Congregationalism, or the particular Baptist, in distinction from the general Baptist, to get the denominational feel, those churches, such as our own, do officially teach this doctrine of John Owen and believe it to be John Owen, as I say, had been a Presbyterian and was a Congregationalist and was teaching good Congregational doctrine, which would not be good Roman Catholic or good Methodist or good Lutheran doctrine on this particular point. That was good Luther doctrine. I hope nobody got lost on that point. I mentioned to you earlier that Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Cranmer, Knox, all the leading reformers of the Reformation were committed to the Owen type of doctrine. Lutheranism has moved away from it, and so has Methodism, which came out of the Anglican Church, out of the Cranmer Church itself. Those churches have moved away from it subsequently. So uh, don't hesitate to raise a historical question, but uh, speaking of putting it in a sentence, the Reformation main movement was committed to the Owen type of doctrine. All of the churches in it subsequently. Rome resisted it, and subsequently, a number of Protestant denominations, such as the Lutheran denomination, have departed from the position of their own reformers. The Lutherans from Luther, the uh, Methodists from Cranmer, and the Anglican tradition. Okay, yes, please. I'm sorry. Who just said? Missouri Synod. Yes, so there's no difference on Missouri uh, people on that. The, the founder of the Missouri, she's asking about the Missouri Synod Lutheran. They are the, the largest conservative body of Lutherans. That's probably the reason you uh, question it. And uh, they would not admit, incidentally, that Luther did believe that. Say, Gerst is wrong on this point, so I'd have to have a debate with him on that. But I think I'm right, and I think I could win the debate if I could get over to sit, there, sit down on the, on the thing. But at any rate, they, they think they have Luther on their side. But they wouldn't doubt that they're differing with John uh, Owen on this point. But the founder of the Missouri Center Lutheran, Walter, is still a revered saint in their movement. He spoke so strongly that some Lutherans called him a Calvinist which for them was, <laughs> was worse than calling him a Roman Catholic or a Hindu or something, really, to call him a Galvanist. Once you have a tension on this point, you see, the, the Luther and the, the Reform were so close together that in 1530 they almost united on the Augsburg Confession. It was only the Eucharistic question. And then later came this development. Well, the Lutherans have such a veneration for Martin Luther, as we do too, of course, and so on, and they just can't imagine Martin Luther committing an error like this. It would be an error in their opinion. Let's take a look at the first argument, then, of, uh, of uh, Thomas Moore. That which the Scripture oft and plainly affirmeth in plain words is certainly true and to be believed. Proverbs 22, 21, Isaiah 8, 20, 2 Peter 1, 19, and 20. But that Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom and by the grace of God tasted death for every man is oft and plainly affirmed in Scripture, as is before shown. Chapters 7 to 13, you won't see those, of course, but most of the arguments from that section are re uh, capitulated here, so you'll, see, you'll meet the, all of the basic arguments before this paper, of course, is over. Therefore, the same is certainly a truth to be believed. John 20, 31, Acts 6, uh, 26, 27. Now, see, if you were at home, I wish you'd just put your hand over this or put the document down in it. Uh, or just copy this off and just wrestle with that. And uh, he says, uh, that which the Scripture teaches in plain words, as we believe, you will not like to have any trouble with that. Uh, but uh, I warn you, that uh, um, Owen is going to have to say something about that, that Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom. You remember a text said something like that. And by the grace of God tasted death for every man. You know something in Hebrew said something about tasting death and so on. 
plainly affirmed in the scripture. So there are at least two passages cited right there, this ransom and tasting death uh, for every man. And you can look up uh, uh, some verses if you want to. Therefore, here comes the conclusion, the same is certainly a truth to be believed. So if the Bible, uh, the word of God, and this is what the Bible teaches, as is indicated, then it is to be believed. Therefore, the universal design of the atonement is to uh, be believed on seemingly impregnable arguments. First of all, the Bible is uh, what it teaches, you get from plain, its plain words, and secondly, that it teaches this doctrine, and thirdly, the ergo, the therefore, you must believe of this doctrine. The, the logic is tight, nothing wrong with that, and yet you, you know that John Owen and John Gerson are going to have something to say on this uh, thing, and so you say to yourself, well, I don't see what's wrong, but let's look, but that's what you do, but since we have just a few minutes uh, left here, let me just get started on John Owen, you see the way he does it, but uh, we'll, we'll have a real, uh, real discussion on that when we come back next time, but also read argument too. We'll not go beyond that. Like, we might go try, but, but don't look at Owen's answer um, until you've worked it out. I don't mind you looking at his answer before you come to class, but you first of all wrestle with it before, uh, before you do. But now here comes Owen's reply. Well, first of all, answer one, scriptures affirming anything in plain words must mean the thing signified and not merely the words. Oh, you say, oh, yes, of course, that's understood, uh, and so on. Jesus said, your man must be born again. And when Nicodemus said, what do you do? I, do I enter again in my mother's womb and be born? Oh, no, 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 not that, of course, but that's what he said. Man must be born again, and so on. And if it's going to be literal, then Nicodemus is to be commended rather than rebuked for that interpretation. Another occasion, remember, Christ referred to the leaven of the Sadducees and to leaven and so on, and the, uh, they were looking in their knapsacks for a supply of leaven and so on, and Christ gently rebuked them. He was talking about pride that pours all through a human being. So just because the Bible says something in plain English doesn't mean that that's the thing signified. And, uh, you know, uh, Thomas More isn't going to deny that any more than anyone will in this room, but it could be relevant in a given instance. So let's be on our guard about it as uh, what he's saying. It's understood. He agrees, of course, but scriptures affirming anything in plain words must mean the thing signified and not merely the word. The word world, for example, before we finish this discussion, we're going to be with that word world, I'm sure, a dozen times where it means world and it doesn't mean world. It means world in one sense and not another sense and so on. You see, uh, this matter of biblical hermeneutics, remember Luther's principle, literal wherever possible. You start out with it literal. And if leaven can mean the kind that you put in bread, that's what it means, and so on. But if it can't mean, then, of course, it can't mean. And the Bible doesn't mean it to be taken literally, so you have to find that. Now, the second point he makes, if you mean that the strictly literal is true, then you must believe the blasphemy of those who thought God had a, a human body. This is my body, the most controverted words in history. This hocus corpus meum, this is my body. Remember, this is the thing that really broke the Reformation. Here's Luther thumping on that velvet cloth there at Marburg in Germany. This is hocus corpus meum, saying it in the Latin rather than the, in the um, Greek. This is my body, this is my body, hocus corpus meum. He was being absolutely literal there. Here's Echolampadius and others saying that Christ says, I'm the vine, and so on. You don't pick grapes on him. He's the door. You don't like, grab him by the handle or anything like that, and so on. But this is my body, hocus corpus meum, and so on. Well, if you're going to believe that, then you're going to believe uh, transubstantiation or his younger brother, transubstantiation. <laughs> the answer to it is most people, you see, most Protestant people would say, well, that's wrong. Manifestly, transubstantiation is wrong, and so on. So. Obviously, literalism can be a casualty, and we've got to be very careful here about Moore's literalism with respect to this subject. Answer two. Now, the bell's about to ring. I'll just read it, and we'll just have to dismiss. I won't be able to come. Ransom for every man never occurs in the Scripture. That phrase, he's not saying there's an issue here, but that's just for, to please note it. Two, tasting death for every man is in Hebrews 2.9, but it does not necessarily mean every man. Compare, for example, Colossians 1.28, where Paul speaks of warning every man, but does not mean every man in the world. And then answer number three, all of these biblical references apply to the brethren of Christ and the sons by him brought to glory. And Owen suggests that we look at the context of them, which is the most crucial part 
of all, and I suggest you do that. We'll take some time. We'll start next session, remember, uh, with argument uh, two, and not argument one, since we've already gone over that, uh, no, uh, to see what you have done with argument two without looking at Owen. About 10 minutes, and then we'll take about 20 minutes on uh, completing uh, argument number one, and then spend the rest of the time on argument number two weeks from now. Next week, remember, this class will not be meeting. Shall we close? Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word, and we thank Thee for the providence which has brought us to search Thy Word. We know we are intellectually lazy and lazy in many other ways, and we'll do more than, no more than we have to do, and we're very inclined to be that way with Thy Word, letting dust accumulate on its pages and even more dust in our mind about its meaning. We pray, o, we thank Thee, O God, that these historic debates and controversies have made it impossible for us to be lazy and that if we are going to be honest, we must search the Scripture diligently, trembling at thy word, and determined to let the word have free course in me, and us to be workmen needing not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. May this course do that for us incidentally, and especially help us to understand for whom Christ died. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm the advisor to the Honor Society at the University, and they're having their meeting this afternoon to pick candidates. It goes for about five hours, so I won't make it tonight. I apologize. Uh, I've read the pantheism. Uh, you don't have it. to apologize, man. We're just glad to have everyone we can and, get And uh, next Sunday, we're going to be in Florida. We're visiting them up. Ah, I see. Uh, we'll, we'll get over to Keswick, which is the yeah. Moody's uh, camp there. Do you know that? The what? Keswick. Keswick, yes. It's in, yeah. Okay, they have one down in... Florida, yeah, I, didn't know about, I knew about Jersey. And, and uh, the pastor at uh, Peoria Presbyterian is going to be the speaker that we've done. Oh, yeah. So you want done. me to say hello yeah, to him? Give my greetings. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>